everyone. So in this session, we're going to tackle uh, chapter seven, the ecology of freedom, which I, I didn't do a word count, but it strikes me as, as one of the, the shorter, if not the shortest chapter in the book. And so um, I, I, I welcome a short chapter this time of year, uh, especially uh, in, a, in a book that has many chapters that even the shortest uh, are packed with lots of, of insights and stuff to chew on. So this, uh, this chapter I really appreciated because it is so, uh, to me, uh, straight, straightforward in its argument. The title, of course, Ecology of Freedom, is a, a direct reference to Murray Bookchin's work, uh, his pioneering work in social ecology, which the authors reference, though they're using it in a, in a different term, in a different um, uh, way, and they're quite explicit in the footnotes in distinguishing how they are both inspired by uh, his work, but also are revisiting some of the arguments that he made about uh, prehistorical society that they're able to um, add some complexity to. And that's where they deviate is in some of the, the conclusions that they ultimately reach. But where they're similar is that uh, the Davids and, and Bookchin both agree that human engagement with the biosphere really turns on the sorts of social arrangements, systems of social organization that people have in place. And so as much as the biosphere, one's engagement with the biosphere will of course shape one's social arrangements, it's not a, an a priori determination that social arrangements really uh, determine the way that people uh, engage with, with the biosphere. And that, that kind of, of uh, premise has been lost in a lot of the, the scholarship that has taken some of the arguments of prehistory and archaeology to then link it to this ultimately teleological argument about how given the complexity of human society today that we need the sort of hierarchy and unequal distribution that we have. And so they're peeling away at that larger conventional wisdom, which of course requires them going back in time to when agriculture was new on uh, the earth for human societies. And it wasn't this simple story of discovering agriculture and the revolution uh, then follows. And as Rousseau would have it, we then become trapped in chains of our own making. And so they, they start with the idea that there was no single agricultural revolution that to, to really put it in that capital A, capital R kind of, of usage is playing into the idea that it was a singular event and that the archaeological record for some time now uh, has, has suggested otherwise. And that this might be well known uh, among archaeologists, I, I'm not sure, but if it is, it's not an, a kind of argument that's reaching into I think larger discourses about you know the 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 big theory history, um, like Jared Diamond, um, and so what they they uh, show is the adoption, abandonment, readoption of agriculture, and that it wasn't a simple diffusionist model that once agriculture started, that that people. Um, maintained that relationship uh, forever. And so their idea of ecology of freedom is precisely the freedom to come into agriculture and then leave it. And that, so that kind of third freedom 
uh, the third element of freedom, the ability to abandon, to walk away, is something that for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years in human development uh, existed. And so they, they use a couple examples, uh, the Nile Valley and uh, Amazonia to make their case to show that, that farming typically started uh, as an economy of deprivation. That yes, we can find evidence of it in areas in alluvial plains uh, where there's great mineral resource, but that more often than not, farming was the result of adopting that practice only after other practices um, uh, weren't available, only when uh, other better options weren't available. And so agriculture ended up starting in areas where resources were often the thinnest rather than the richest. Uh, and that's basically how they, they conclude the chapter. And they give a hint that the next chapter is going to show that, um, that there were then cities that relied on agriculture, but that agriculture was not the defining characteristic of those cities and that you could have agriculture in the absence of, of uh, stratification and then you could have um, cities in the absence of the sort of stratifications that scholars have come to equate with, with urbanization. So the, the argument here is, um, is really, I think we're at the, at the heart of the argument of the overall book because they're now relying on archeological evidence to show that there wasn't a linear process, a, a, a simple linear process of agricultural revolution, but it really started in a series of fits and starts over long periods of time. And the, the, uh, the map in particular that they show on page 252 of the independent uh, crop and animal domestication centers uh, gives, provides a nice, uh, overview of how agriculture happened across the planet and not just simply in one, one, one place of the, um, the Fertile Crescent. And, um, and that there were lots of agricultural revolutions and no single simplistic uh, process. So I'd love to hear from uh, others. Uh, especially if anyone has uh, archaeological uh, background, which um, I do not. So the, their argument to me is, um, I mean, I take it face value that uh, uh, Wengro as an archaeologist is synthesizing a lot of arguments that specialists within the field have already been aware of, but that uh, general readership is, is perhaps not, not heard about. And it certainly uh, isn't the sort of evidence that's in uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, textbooks, history textbooks, at least like ancient civilization texts. Um, so I'd love to hear from anyone who has uh, thoughts or questions or comments. Mika. So I don't have an archaeological background, <laughs> obviously, and I can't comment on that. So if anyone want to comment on archaeological part, uh, they're welcome. If not, I will just talk mm -hmm. that for me, it was interesting to, to read this chapter about women and uh, agriculture and gardening. Um, and that's uh, kind of direct reference to Silvia Friedrichi. Um, and to the uh, woman knowledge production and uh, how a woman was producing this knowledge of dealing with the crops in general and plants and wild plants and using them for different ways, also for medicine and for kind of 
different different ways. So it's um, I don't really understand how you wouldn't you call it, it domestication or not when you just uh, go out into nature and figure out how everything works and how how body can benefit uh, human humans can benefit so adjust to whatever is out there like a plants. Um, so it was very feminist uh, trope in the in this chapter. That I liked. Yeah, I like how they 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 make that link direct the association between domestication and and domestic uh, care. Um, and I also love how they how they show that domestication itself isn't a singular process and that that it um, that that too can happen in in myriad ways um, depending on the the social arrangements that are that are in place um, yeah it's a, a a real fascinating way of of thinking about of of starting from imagination because then you know that the authors really allow us to imagine the range of of possibilities of social and cultural possibilities that existed because we're not they they don't succumb to infantilizing the subjects that they're writing about even though the subjects never really take um, you know, they, they never have names, <laughs> but, but I, I feel like at any moment, like, you know, carnival's possible for them. And that, you know, with a seasonal change that they're, they're free to experiment in these ways that, that I, I almost, when I read it, I, I can almost hear David kind of urging people, you know, go on, try it. You, you know, you can actually walk away from things and experiment it might only be for 20 minutes but these are the sorts of reminders that this book is trying to chart over a, a hundred thousand year um, uh, time span yeah and in this case maybe the the reference to the mary bookchin and ecology of freedom is also like what is agriculture now is this monocrops and you know industrial production and then what the uh, woman did that was very kind of you know particular connection to each individual plants and each individual plants would be used for specific purpose sometimes for food sometimes for you know getting rid of the babies sometimes for <laughs> something else so it's a different idea of how you relate. And I wonder if it's called domestication or not. Is it like this? Uh, it's not even gardening. What is that when you, how do you call it in English? When you go into the nature and, and you know, like you just acknowledge how to how to use the, the, the environment around you. This is not domestication. Huh? What, is, what is domestication actually? how you define domestication as uh, you produce certain crops over the many years that is very efficient and if you go out in the forest and just specifically pick up something that is good for you once when you seek let's say or when you want to have certain strength it's not domestication, is it? Uh, no, domestication is when uh, a plant or an animal cannot uh, anymore survive uh, without uh, humans. Is the word you're looking for more like exploitation? Although that has a negative resonance? It's a negative. But domestication no. also negative, is it or not? No. Not necessarily. Um, Ellen had a raised hand. 
Okay, just to leap into this, I think the the question about domestication is really important. Um, I, I think a definition of it is the one uh, Simona provided, but there's obviously a really long path between um, foraging and reaching the point where um, flora and fauna become dependent on humans to replicate. So one of the things that I think hasn't come through in some of the uh, popularizations that we get look that we look at is this huge area between those two points. And um, so one of the thing, I'm, I'm not an archeologist, I, I, I'm an anthropologist has been in, in joint departments. So I pick up some of this, but it, so, so for, from that point of view, it seems um, there's certainly sp specialist knowledge in that area but I think that we haven't given enough attention to um, all of that um, history and uh, contemporary practice that uses um, and to some and engages with um, gardening in, in various descriptions that isn't agriculture. And you know, there's a huge realm of that, which is what they're bringing. Uh, the, the attention to focus on, so that um, it, it, if we look at things that are more historical, we tend to call it horticulture that isn't so so completely controlling, and that's been alive and well right into the modern world. And it's it's interesting in the way that the stories that we've had of human history have sort of ignored the fact that agriculture isn't the only you know in, in terms of this rigid domestication and intensive cultivation isn't the only thing that's ever been going on. So there's, in that popular history, this has been missed out, although it's abundantly obvious right into the contemporary world. So what in a sense is being opened up in this book is a whole range of different kinds of interaction with um, the natural world that uh, somehow didn't get into some of the unilinear stories we tell ourselves. It, it wasn't going directly from foraging to intensive agriculture. It was um, something else. And, and I think it also, uh, I stand to be corrected perhaps by archeologists, but as I've encountered it, there's generally the thought that there were a, a number of separate points at which um, agriculture emerged. and it would only make sense to think there were many points at which there were horticulture, um, but there isn't an argument that, as I understand that most people would say, that everything came from one breakthrough. I think that isn't the case, but it, it was that there were a number of them that then uh, did, did become diffused, but that could be a, might require some, some further investigation of what people think happened um, with, with diffusion. The, and the last word on that really is that if you look at the, the ethno-historical and ethnographic uh, discussions of horticultural societies, there's really a very strong connection uh, with, with women's knowledge of plants and uh, also with a very different uh, modes of social organization that are less patriarchal. Um, that's again, not one, scheme that fits every single society. There's all kinds of choice and variation, but there's a tendency in that direction. That's it for me. Stephen, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, I think that's what's so interesting about the, the, the use of the phrase play farming. And I find it a bit strange because it doesn't quite sound, it sounds a bit clunky, but the way I was taking it was, activities which go beyond foraging in the sense that you're actively shaping and sort of, you know, changing how plants grow, behave, changing the environment, but in a way that, that isn't domestication, is this, this, this sort of like in-between space between for, foraging and domestic agriculture. And maybe that's why it's been so hard to sort of pin 
pin down or to see because it's it's as a sort of in between liminal activity that doesn't fit into two categories um, and go can go back and forth between them. Uh, I just uh, jump in. I thought I I thought um, I was it was quite interesting to see that they. The, the careful footnote on social ecology that they were they're very much the premise of socioecology uh, social ecology that people's relationship to the environment deals with their social relations um, but not so much they 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 sort of didn't agree with the actual details so it would be interesting to see if in the future some people who are um kind of within that social ecology movement will engage with that and try to rewrite uh, some of the early history um, the, the thing that I thought was interesting was, um, I mean, because this chapter blends in really well, uh, quite a lot with the previous one, which was the Gardens of Adonis and looks very much at the sort of gender relations of the um, thing. But this very short chapter on ecology of freedom, um, uh, it seems to be engaging with, with just to bust the idea of the agricultural revolution, which was a... Um, and, and so looking at this chapter as a little bit of a, um, uh, of it, it, I mean, for our archaeologists, this may be a, 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 a nerdy argument about details, but I, I think we wouldn't have to know that much about the archaeology to kind of say, well, if you can give clear examples of why the, myth, the agricultural revolution as it is conceived in general, doesn't work, then you've you've successfully broken a myth down, and I think that is maybe what this whole book uh, does. In is it, it's it it's kind of a un, unpicks a myth that we have um, the, in our culture now about modernization that there was an agricultural revolution and then an industrial revolution and now an information age revolution that type of step function. Um, and um, I just flag what might be relevant for this chapter on page 213, which is way, which is back in that the uh, Gardens of Adonis. It has this I, this guy's name, um, Gordon Child, uh, who um, wrote, who invented the word agricultural revolution in the 30s and 40s. So that's this period of time in, where you're really seeing. Um, this bursting on the scene of all the uh, technological powers. Those are the times when uh, you have a, a, you know, a modernist movement or a futurist movement. These types of, of declarations in Europe were um, um, right at a time when huge military, um, the militarism created, created huge mechanical innovations. And so you have those types of of reestablishing how people think about the world, and and that maybe is if you if you kind of see this as a lot of the book is undoing Rousseau, you could also somebody could take this chapter and use it and compare the archaeological evidence to this early history in the 1930s and 40s of modernism and where we invent this myth of the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution. And now people have go the information age revolution. And I, I think that would make a, a nice addition to this genre, like a future book out of a genre that comes out of this type of thing. Yeah, you know, and if you think about it, the, those conceptual constructions of revolution, the the industrial, the agricultural, the industrial, and the information, those get preserved and documented because they're really, they're forms of commerce. And so what they're really documenting is the, the sorts of exploitative exchanges or transactions that, that happen uh, among among state leaders, uh, in, in many cases, or entrepreneurs and state authorities, um, but they seem to be, the authors seem to be making this. Well, they they've made it elsewhere in, in some of the articles that, that preceded the book that 
if one falls into the trap of using monuments and agricultural records as as proxies for civilization, then you're really just writing a history of the state and, and of, of commerce, but state coerced commerce. And it really poses a problem for the kind of approach that they're taking because they're, if they are looking at foragers or populations that relied on a, uh, horticulture rather than, than agriculture, then it's not going to, to leave that documentary basis. And so um, I, I think it that kind of emphasis on the commercial aspect was not only a function of the evidence, but I think it was also a function of what people thought of as legitimate kinds of, of evidence that uh, that I, I think science is now able to offer some tools and technologies that allow for reconstruction of, of other evidences that are going to make for what I hope is a, a, a broader kind of, of sense of these many agricultural uh, revolutions rather than a, a singular one. Simona wants to say something. Oh, Simona, yes. If I can unmute me. Uh, yes. Um, good evening. Um, I think the the very point of this uh, chapter and even of the of the chapter six is uh, uh, the difference between uh, serious agriculture culture and play. And uh, um, the point is uh, uh, proving that a serious agriculture is not a destiny of humanity, is not the only possibility at hand. And uh, um, there is actually a bias in uh, our knowledge about uh, the other possibilities uh, that uh, run alongside uh, that of uh, agriculture, but uh, the bias is uh, uh, that we have much more evidence for uh, uh, civilization based on agriculture um, because uh, it's a Eurasian uh, civilization. We uh, know what happened in Eurasia and Oceania and Africa because they were uh, strictly interconnected before the discovering of uh, Americas, while Americas uh, stayed uh, se separate and developed the other uh, possibilities. And uh, I think this is the reason why this book is so focused on uh, American indigenous people uh, rather than uh, on uh, Africa and uh, Mesopotamia. And when they uh, talk about uh, Eurasia, it's uh, to confront uh, Eurasian solutions uh, uh, against uh, America's solution. Um, What's important uh, in this uh, difference between uh, serious commitment uh, and uh, playful commitment is that in the playful one, uh, uh, you have a, a plural, plurality of solutions uh, to the human needs. And uh, um, play is a strong word uh, because they want to stress the uh, not serious uh, uh, commitment uh, of it. But um, what's important, uh, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, is the opposition to serious commitment. Uh, the first uh, uh, people that um, seriously committed to agriculture did, uh, did so in uh, um, environment uh, uh, left over uh, by other uh, by forage hunters uh, 
um, it was a, a marginal uh, solution to our uh, food problem. And uh, actually the most uh, wise uh, idea would be not to commit too seriously to agriculture. Uh, it, the most wise idea, the wiser idea is to have a, a multiplicity of solutions uh, and when one files, you have the others. Um, this appears to be what uh, happened in Americas. And uh, um, it also appears to be, to have been uh, a, a war. Uh, the um, conscious refu refusal of agriculture in uh, uh, North American indigenous population appears to be the result of something that happened uh, in, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, Ka well, I don't remember. Uh, in central- Cahokia. Cahokia, thank you. Um, so the, the idea of conscious refusal of a serious commitment to agriculture uh, is important there. Uh, but also the fact that um, in uh, most cases, uh, in uh, Americas, uh, uh, people choose uh, not to commit too seriously to agriculture. Uh, I hope I was not so too confused. Okay. Um, hi, I just uh, want to make a comment, uh, add on to what we've all been saying is that one another way that I've understood uh, play farming was not only was it an experimentation and a refusal to commit to one thing, but it, it had to happen in a time when it wasn't like a, a matter of life and death, when there was the room and the space and the other resources available that allowed for this kind of playful experimentation. So it's, it's yeah, so it's not, it's not simply like not taking it seriously, but not having to take it seriously. And uh, I also want to say this comment about serious committed agriculture versus play farming with benefits is brilliant. <laughs> right. So I just wanted to add, add that to the topic of play farming. So yeah, um, the fact that that there was I don't know, not necessarily an abundance, but but options, and you know, and this not does not need to commit to you know brutal toil for 40, 50, 60 hours a week is you know a condition for the the experimentation and the playfulness and other um, forms of uh, social experimentation that would follow from that. And, uh, you know, it seems like, and yeah. And it's funny because just uh, before this, I, I didn't finish it, but I was just reading um, David Graeber's other article about uh, play or fun from Baffler a few, a few, a while back. And I was hoping to finish that in time, um, but it's some interesting connections there. Yeah, Stephen. One thing I was surprised by it not showing up, um, and I'm going to struggle to remember the exact details, but I seem to remember in James Scott's book, The Art of Not Being Governed, which I think appears about 200 pages after this, there's some discussion about walking away from agriculture, walking away from certain forms of agriculture, particularly those that were easier to sort of track, regulate, or inspect. So for instance, like why certain places there would be a preference for root vegetables as opposed to rice, because rice, you, 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 you can't hide rice, right? Because it's really obvious, visible. It's totally easy to, um, to regulate while a root vegetable can be grown and, and left and, and, and come back to. So I, I'm, I'm just thinking a lot here, if there's some, some connection between different particular forms of crops grown that in that James Scott argument and how that might overlap here or whether that, that's, that's something totally separate. I'm not sure because I haven't read that book in a few years. Does anybody remember? It, yeah, um, so he he does and, and Jim Scott's got sort of a big take on the specificity of, of crop cultivation based on being able to hide 
uh, you know, the, the, the ease of, of um, obscuring what's being, being grown. Um, and so, yeah, in, in highland areas where there's a lot of terraced farming, that requires a level of la labor input and, and uh, that, that I, I don't know if play farming would really accommodate itself to, you know, to terrace farming, probably not. And so, you, you know, Scott uses it to make this larger argument where topography also matters because as one goes higher up in elevation, one is escaping state authority and that that's sort of, you know, this universal premise that, that Scott uses. Um, and then he makes a similar argument in Against the Grain where, where the evidence he presents shows that, that in many cases, the first forms of agriculture were uh, the result of enslaved labor um, and that it was not a, a, a good option uh, in most cases. And so the, the two Davids are, are building upon uh, Scott's work, um, I, I think very, very nicely um, Scott's one of the, the few uh, to have the kind of, of historical and geological or geographical rather range that uh, David Graver does. Um, it, so it's, uh, it, it's nice to see two brilliant minds tackle some similar questions. Well, I, I also remember that, that David had talked about in, in, in 2005, David had talked with, 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 with James about, about doing a project together, which never happened for, for obvious reasons. But so I wouldn't be surprised if some of the conversations, conversations they had then sort of then filtered through to this 15 years later. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, that they had uh, talked about collaborating. Um, that has me really curious. I, might ask. I don't know if Vasily would know the answer to that, or or Nika, perhaps. Um, that that would have been fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Why are there so few anarchists in the academy? Yep. <laughs> Maybe that's the question they would have asked. <laughs> yeah, Nika. Maybe it's uh, Niki first. Oh yeah, yeah sure. Um, I don't have a, a theory about this, but more like an intuition that I can imagine that um, when people were experimenting, that it also could be like a sacred science or a sacred duty. So that's why they don't want to expand it or um, to, to um, make it a dominant uh, thing, but it's really like a sacred thing. So they keep it small. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely the case, and the you know the overlap among science, religion, and magic, you know, is something that since the Enlightenment, I think Western society's gotten gotten wrong, um, or just separated them and and gone about their business. Uh, let's see. There was uh, Nika. Were you going to? then say something? It was somebody else that I didn't want to. Uh, ah. no. Yeah, OK. So actually, my question is, uh, can we explore the difference between play and culture? Because agriculture, <laughs> it's, it seems like this world is kind of constitutes something like very rigid framework in which we are, by definition, uh, already um, not free. Yeah, I don't know if anybody want to say something about that. I think Simona, when she started to talk about, uh, um, yeah, that's that's when I wanted to comment on Simona's uh, trend. I I'm supposed to answer now. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I think, um, I don't know if uh, I told you, I'm trying to, uh, 
to uh, watch the examine the evolution of uh, concepts uh, and terms uh, in uh, David's uh, David Gerber's uh, uh, thought. And uh, uh, I think that play is one of the keywords uh, uh, that are worth uh, being examined. And um, one uh, one element is that of uh, uh, what's the point of uh, we can't have fun, which is uh, the one that Michael uh, is uh, reading, I, I guess, in Buffer. And uh, another is uh, uh, the last chapter of uh, the Utopia of Rules, uh, where it's uh, opposed uh, to games. Um, I'm not sure uh, agriculture is uh, in uh, in as much it's uh, culture opposed to play. Uh, culture can be a crea creative uh, thing and uh, uh, mobile thing, and uh, it has all possibilities in uh, inside it. Um, Maybe the the difference is uh, uh, between being uh, constrained in uh, one solution uh, when you start uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, sewing and uh, on agriculture, you are stuck in, in the- But isn't it also connected to yeah. the colonialism? It's like said that, okay, so the, this particular type of civilization invented agriculture and then, you know, uh, they invented like something else and that's how they took over the world. And the, in this case, what word culture is like, you know, mm. stuff for, for, for quality and also for, for mm -hmm. analytical dominance. And the play, play is the kind of things that, you know, people do that sometimes, but it's not really essential. Yeah. Uh... Speaking, but I maybe Mary and Mark should uh, jump in. Um, so I'll comment uh, after them because I I have an idea. Mark, you are muted, or uh, but maybe it was Mary I, first. I, Mary would go. Okay, um, I just wanted to say that I think the narrative of the evolution of production, um, you know, from, you know, hunter gatherers to agriculture to industrial revolution to the information revolution, all of this has been used essentially to justify empires, um, as we know, and it was pretty much used all along to, towards justifying the British empire, you know, we're bringing civilization to this uncivilized people, which is why they had such complex rituals and et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas the idea of play sounds to me to be much more friendly towards, um, is towards the American empire, the ruling empire that we have now, um, which is more of a, you know, it focuses on freedom and we're just liberating these people and they're free to do everything they want so long as it's convenient to us. That's sort of how, how it seems to go. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because I think there's a danger that we take what the Davids are saying around play and freedom and we turn it into something that is very much individualized. They, what they would probably say is that these play and this um, freedom to choose would apply to the collective as well, which is something that goes against the official mainstream narrative. This, this idea of, civil, of societies or groups or even nation state experimenting with their own economies or their own agriculture, whatever it happens to be, that is not allowed in the current framework. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that in in case just to bring it into that context. So now I have uh, three very disparate points. Um, one was just what you were saying, Mary. It's sort of like the difference of anarchist play versus libertarian play. 
libertarian as we understand it in the United States. It's not the European. Uh, but I agree, that's, that's uh, dangerous stuff. Um, the other point I had was uh, Nikki, uh, Mary, and Tanya were talking about the spirit, spirituality of the cultivators. And um, uh, I really appreciated that perspective because it's where you're listening to nature as opposed to telling nature what to do. Um, and, and when Nikki was saying, you're not gonna make that a dominant force, you know, say agriculture is the way to go because you're actually listening to nature in a much different way in the spiritual traditions, I think. My last uh, disparate point was, I don't know if anybody else had this feeling about the mystery of the linear, linear pottery tradition, uh, whatever happened there 5,000 years ago uh, was very, to me, still a mystery, even with somewhat explanations in the background. Um, but uh, when Michael and, and Stephen were talking about play as experimentation, it seems to me that that was an experimentation with cost. That is, it, you know, something else happened there. Um, and they were suggesting that it might have been, you know, some things like maybe they didn't, didn't bring enough kinds of cereal. Maybe they didn't bring enough kinds of pulse or something like that to that area. And then you had established foragers on the circumference. And what happened, we don't know, but it was a failure of some kind. And it seems to me that, that the, the freedom, the, the theme of a, ecology of freedom is suggesting that we need to be able to experiment without those sorts of costs. Anyway, that's still a mystery to me, that, that part. And sometimes I think they leave little exercises for the reader to think about. Michael, would you like to go? Sure, yeah. Um, another, just a, another point um, playing around the concept of play um, that, you know, in most, um, in, in class-based societies and especially, you know, in contemporary capitalism with, with this emphasis on wage labor, there's a very necessary ideology that kind of convinces that work and play must be completely separate spheres. And in, in other words, like you literally have to work just so you're allowed to play a little in your evenings and weekends or something like that. And I think what they're what, what what's been happening in this book and showing us these alternative ways of organizing society is that this doesn't have to be the case that you know work, you know work in terms of you know, in terms, terms of working to reproduce your, yourself, your community, family, community, society can also be pleasurable, can also be experimental, and there doesn't have to be the strict division between you know uh, mindless wage labor toil and the little bit of leisure that you get afforded after it and. You know, it's been quite important to, you know, for to, in order to maintain the status quo of our society that uh, that we do think in terms of, you know, there's there's this massive divide between labor and leisure, work and play. And uh, one, you know, we have to do one in order to get a bit of the other. And what's the alternatives that were that that are being presented in this book are inc incredibly, um, um, you know, encouraging in this in this regard, especially if, you know, if you really hate your job, for example. I mean, not everyone is not everyone does wage labor. Some people do. Some a lot of people do have you know really really fulfilling, valuable, interesting, fun work. But you know, in in most of our societies, there's a lot of people need to have the really really un, uh, thankless wage labor just to keep it all going. And and on top of that, so that another small class can just simply enjoy all the play. And then they don't even play. <laughs> no, no, they're miserable. They have so much money, uh, so much wealth that they don't even know what to do with it. Like they don't know how to play anymore. More, 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 more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I? Uh, I think uh, the um, there is a connection between fear, fear, and uh, uh, the refusal of play. Do you remember the? A tale of the grasshopper and the ant. Um, <clears throat> it's a. Um, uh, it's fascinating that uh, in a Sikh tradition there is a totally different uh, tale about it. 
uh, but uh, in uh, our tradition, uh, uh, we are dominated by the fear of starvation. And uh, you are not serious if you don't, uh, uh, if you are not afraid to starve. And if you uh, spend uh, your summer singing and uh, playing. Um, what, uh, and uh, what happened when uh, Europeans uh, uh, invaded uh, uh, Americas uh, is that a uh, population uh, uh, that reproduced uh, uh, a lot, uh, Amer uh, indigenous Americans were able to uh, keep their freedom because they uh, kept uh, um, population uh, at a low level. There were there was plenty of space because uh, uh, there were not too many people, while uh, uh, Europeans tend to accumulate population and uh, go gods uh, goods, and uh, I think uh, there's a true. Uh, things are related and uh, both are about uh, uh, fear, uh, about the seven uh, uh, major cause uh, and the seven uh, fat cause. And um, so maybe the main difference between uh, uh, Eurasian European culture uh, I don't know uh, about Asia. And uh, Americas is, uh, uh, is fear at, at the end of the day. And uh, the opposition is uh, uh, between fear and play. And uh, uh, Calvinism is a successful uh, uh, removal of play, of everything that is useless from life. Uh, and useful uh, means uh, uh, useful in order to uh, avoid starvation. Those are hard words to follow. <laughs> I mean, it's it's right there. And then Monica with the uh, the quote. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, from Utopia of Rules, uh, that what ultimately lies behind the appeal of bureaucracy is fear of play. Yeah. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time. It's 3.59 uh, New York time. Um, so is there anyone, uh, let's say I do see a couple hands up, uh, Michael and Mark. Michael, would you like to, to add something? Um, uh, just that, um, I guess when we talk about, I, I didn't really get Nika's thing about culture versus play until I realized that the origin of the word culture is, is, uh, culturing the soil. I mean, that's, and it's quite funny that our modern conception of culture is rooted only in the last couple of hundred years. Um, and so it roots back to agriculture. It does point to this book, the dawn of everything is going back such vast periods of time um, that nothing in it is really relevant to today in any direct sense um, other than the lesson which seems to be their continual lesson which is um, un undoing a mythology of this was the origin of society and these are the rules actually the rules were quite <laughs> brought open for many zillions of years um, and um, I'm like my own relation to, to agriculture, you know, I suppose I have family farming in a background and all that, but like most of us, we go down to the grocery store and we get food. And even the, ag the agriculture we're talking about right now in, in this book by David Graeber is not even the agriculture of the last couple of hundred years. And the agriculture of the last hundred years is actually completely different from the agriculture before that. It's when modernization takes, for, pro, takes place. And our agriculture today is completely supported by fossil fuels. Um, and in fact, one of the most progressive political movements 
uh, that's the largest movement is Via Campesina, which would argue that if the if the if we see industrial collapse, it is people, you know, the same type of people who could have built those little steps up the Andes and and grow and grow a, a huge amount of food. It involves a huge amount of labor, but that's what would keep a huge amount of people alive today. You know, the alternative would be to give women their own. Uh, power over their own sexual freedom and stop the drive for reproduction and make sex, sexuality play rather than reproductive. And then you might see population voluntarily diminish rather than continually grow. But, I, you know, I don't really know what the, what those kind of dynamics would look like. But the, but the we are in this case of we have been doing a giant experiment with agriculture and and then for a couple hundred years and agriculture and fossil fuels now and the fossil fuels are running out and there's a large, larger amount of people than have ever been on the world. So the idea of going back to foraging and hunter gathering things sounds enticing, except that it really looks more like a Mad Max movie in that sense. So like a rather kind of talk our global leaders down off the ledge and, you know, to bring them back to what is a viable solution. But this, this kind of, yeah, so that's maybe one other part piece of the puzzle for agriculture today versus agriculture back in these times, you know, innumerable times and innumerable places that it's being discussed. Mika? Yeah, I just want to quickly comment that it's many other ways to, to grow food except of uh, hunter gatherers. Forging is like when you pick up the food, yeah? Uh, so we were growing spirulina with David, so that's very, uh, you know, you do it in a jar, in an apartment in the city, so it's playful, so I think it's many other ways of how you feed yourself, it's just a question of social uh, arrangements and uh, individual people allowed to, to be thinking differently. Also, I want to say that in Soviet Union, when it's collapsed, um, and suddenly all these vast big industrial cities uh, were deprived from uh, grocery shopping <laughs> uh, and distribution of food was interrupted. Then the people went to their small dutches, the, the tiny piece of land that they, they had and they started to grow uh, gardening. And then it's in amazing numbers that 70% of the grocery or the food was produced in this tiny piece of land you know in russia where it's actually not it's not ukraine it's not italy it's very difficult to grow anything you know it's not cuba <laughs> but <laughs> it feed themselves so it's kind of like uh, we have many options cuba had to do actually the same thing didn't when when the Soviet Union collapsed, they um they had absolutely nothing, and so they went straight into the gardens and grew food everywhere, plant pots and and it, it, anywhere where you they could grow anything. I mean, obviously they had nicer climate, but um, must have been challenging as well. Um, so there are ways, there are always options. The question is, will do we have the political freedom and or political will? All right, I think that's a good place to uh, to wrap up. So thank you. I, um, I don't know when our next one is. I guess it's in two weeks, but I, will it be a Monday or a Thursday? I don't know. Thursday. Thursday, okay. Thursday is better for me overall. So that's, that's fine. Um, Okay, so we'll do chapter eight, which is uh, the imaginary cities, uh, where we'll get to uh, uh, sink into uh, urban development in Mesoamerica, town of Teotihuacan. So wait for the excitement. Good seeing everyone. And uh, the, on the January the 6th. Is that it, January the 6th? Yes, that is okay. the Befana in Italy. Oh, <laughs> it's a very important uh, uh, so, festivity. Uh, will we see you, Simona? Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye, holidays. Thank you.